Welcome to Game Theorem, where we have serious discussions about absurd entertainment. I love playing Fallout. It's so fun. You know the goals in that game are a racial allegory, right? What? Get politics out of my video games. I mean, they literally have a racial slur, the Z slur, that they made up specifically for this group of people in the game. Oh, you leftists say everything's a slur. The ghoul quest is about poor minorities trying to get into a rich, bougie community of white people. It's about minorities getting access to white people's resources. It can only end with genociding either side or trying to integrate them. Though in a stroke of Bethesda's racism, the game denies you that ending. Well, I didn't like that quest anyway. <laughs> I'm Kira. <laughs> I'm Kyle. And we are talking about uh, racial allegories in media today. Yes. And uh, we gave an example of how people are very determined to try to not see them. Mm-hmm. Um, a friend of ours, Danny, actually helped write this episode, so shout out to her. Yes. Uh, she uh, she wanted to be here to actually do be part of the episode as a guest, but that didn't work out, so I'm here instead. <laughs> mm -hmm, yeah. Uh, so why don't you start us off on like what this episode's about, Kira? Um, this episode is about discussing these racial allegories in media and how they succeed in being an allegory. And in ways they fail, and like just analyzing their existence. All right, let's do some analysis before we give examples. All right, um, a lot of racial allegories in video in video games specifically, but in all media, are oh yeah, we're not just doing video games. Yeah, yeah, um, they kind of fall flat, or they're kind of just iffy in their representation but there are some really good ones that are like no this is exactly how the struggle of minorities is just in a more palatable way i guess you could say of being an allegory so that people can see it yeah i think in in most respects this originated specifically within the sci-fi and uh, to an extent the fantasy genres mm -hmm. uh because you know, for a lot of the 20th century, it was basically taboo to actually discuss uh, identity politics or racial politics or discrimination or oppression in a meaningful way in you know the public discourse. Mm -hmm. um, so people would often use fantastical elements to talk about it. Like Isaac Asimov with uh, science fiction was really big with this, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not just him, but there was a lot of science fiction stories around that time that would use like mutants or aliens or robots or something, right? To talk about oppression. Right. Because if they'd use actual black people, there was the risk that either no one would buy it no one will be allowed to buy it. The government might step in or your corporate publishers will just refuse to publish your work. Yeah, exactly. And in order to get it out there, you had to have a corporation backing you. Because like, let's be real. There are a lot of people still today that think simply acknowledging race is being racist. It's why there's so many white people that when they see a black person and, they're, and they identify their race, they struggle to get it out. They go like... Black. <laughs> because they think simple identification is racist. They think being colorblind is non-racist, when in actuality that is reversed. Being colorblind is racist because you're you're then saying you you're ignoring racism. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so so yeah, and I think also uh, as much as I don't like fantasy, I think it would be wrong to not give fantasy this type of credit as well. Yeah, um, true. In fact, actually, there's been a bit of discourse lately between, like, the whole, like, um, J.K. Rowling and uh, Terry Pratchett. Remember him? Oh, yeah. He wrote the Discworld novels. Yeah. And honestly, like, I don't think he was the king of progressivism. I've read some of his older works, and they're pretty liberal and very, like, second-wave feminism. Mm-hmm. But um, apparently he got better as he went on. And there are some good stuff. Apparently, he even had, like, trans characters. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And um, he points out that a lot of his inspiration was some other fantasy stories. I think maybe even Tolkien might have some stuff. Maybe Tolkien fans might be able to educate us on that. Yeah. <laughs> but the point is, is that fantasy 
Despite its problematic political implications by the nature of not being in the real world, is also given that type of sci-fi license to talk about stories of oppression with fictional groups. And mm -hmm. as problematic as like the fantasy races typically are, there is room to explore that in these worlds. Mm -hmm. I mean, we play D&D, &D, right? Yeah. And that's kind of like something we do with like tiefling characters where they're kind of oppressed, right? Yeah. And maybe it's not the best way to do it. Again, that's kind of what we're doing with this episode is talking about how well these things sort out, mm -hmm. right? Do you have D&D &D on this list, by the way? No, because it does race it races badly. <laughs> I guess we could talk you, about it, but it's not really an allegory. Well, no, but it's not really an allegory. I guess because you're saying it conflates race and species. Yeah, and yeah. it's it it doesn't really try to do the allegory allegory of oppression because it doesn't really specify. Yeah, oppression. it's more of a setting, waiting for you to fill it in with a story. Yeah, exactly. Right. But there are fantasy stories that do that, and sci-fi ones as well. And mm -hmm. I think those are the ones that really kind of pioneered this concept. I can't help but think of, like, Star Trek, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, although Star Trek, part of the reason it was so controversial is they decided, no, we can't just have fake, like, alien Spock Vulcan representation. Let's have an actual black woman in there, you know? Mm -hmm, yeah. And that got a lot of people riled up, but it was worth getting riled up over. Yeah. Because honestly, I think that's one of the biggest critiques of racial allegories. At the end of the day, they're taking the place of actual representation. Yeah, true. True. That is a good criticism, I, I think so. Right. So I don't think racial allegories are bad. You know, it's like, you know, being improv, right? You want to say yes and, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's that, like... Honestly, feel free to do your racial allegories, but don't stop there unless you literally can't go further. You know, people talk about how, like, the Matrix is like a trans allegory, right? Mm -hmm. And it makes sense, right? But, you know, if you're going to have another Matrix movie, put trans characters in there. Keep the allegory, sure, whatever, but if you can also do the actual representation, do it. Mm -hmm. They couldn't back then, but these days, yeah, do it. Yeah. Well, they should have back then, but they didn't. Whatever. Well, they tried, but they weren't allowed to. Yeah, I, I don't fault the directors, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I fault the studio. Yeah. But, but Isn't yes. Isn't there going to be a Matrix 4? Apparently, supposedly. Yeah. I'm, It'd be awesome, but there I'm, were actual trans characters in that one. I'm apprehensive. Yeah, I, I can understand why. Yeah. <laughs> Especially because of how much symbology has been co-opted by the, by the far right. Yeah. People that obviously never watched the movies. Mm -hmm. Or at least never watched the second and third ones. They probably watched the first one when they were five, and that's all they remember from it. Yep. And it was the one 80s movie, or sorry, actually it came out later than that, but it was the one like pre-2000s movie that, uh, that wasn't like super rapey mm -hmm. <laughs> that they remember. <laughs> All right, so you want to get started with our other examples? Yes. So let's see, like, let's see what type of allegories some other pieces of media employ, and mm -hmm. see, you know, how well it works. Yeah. Um. Let's start by talking to. Let's start by talking about Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which came out in 1988 and was a very obvious allegory for the way African-American people were being treated in Hollywood at the time. Yeah, and you know what? Uh, Space Jam 2 just came out, so people might be kind of burned on the idea of mixing live action and animation. But this movie right here is like the original one of doing that. It kind of yeah. pioneered that. Yeah. So, you know, for all its faults, we would definitely recommend going back and giving it another shot. Mm -hmm. Um because I honestly think, like, I, I I think nothing's really kind of come close to doing what it tried to do. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, the movie is set in the 1940s, and it literally references, you know, Jim Crow era segregation and everything black people had to face in that era. It was also, you know, like during the golden age of... Um, of animation like with Disney yes, and whatnot. Yes, 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 exactly. Now, the only thing is like I know like there's a lot of a lot of stuff reinforcing the idea that the tunes and the the, the oppressed minority and who framed Roger Rabbit as black people. Mm -hmm. But the thing is I think you can also make a reading of it that works for Jewish people. 
I suppose so, yeah. Because um, a lot of the West Coast, a lot of um, uh, co- uh, comedic and cultural industries like like the, that exist around Hollywood, right? Have a you know a large of a normal Jewish population. Population. This is just a known fact, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I felt like maybe like because because one of the things is the tunes have jobs. They're like actors and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And while I do like while black people were actors in the 1940s, like that did happen. It wasn't nearly to the level that the tunes portray it, right? Yeah, I guess so. Like for example, like you know, like Donald Duck and Daffy Duck are able to be performers in this world. Mm-hmm. Right, they're able to be on like screens. Their tunes, right? There, people recognize the people watching this movie. Go, hey, I know those two ducks, right? Mm-hmm. It as an allegory, though, like no one's going to recognize the two nameless black actors that were lucky enough to get a job. Yeah, fair enough. Um, perhaps, perhaps I'm ignorant. Perhaps there were some black actors that were really famous back in the day, right? Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I guess I, I guess I think it, I. I think it was more the music scene where they were successful. Uh, yeah, that is possible, but I don't know. I feel like with the animation thing, they were going for a more direct, like, Hollywood thing. Yeah, I guess I see what you mean, yeah. So, but but other points clearly do try to go for the black allegory, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that's more what they were intending. But I'd be interested to hear a Jewish person's perspective of what they thought of the movie. Someone that has more information than I do on the subject. Yeah, I, I would find that interesting. Yeah, definitely. I wanted to mention that the main plot of Who Framed Roger Rabbit is all about the destruction of Toontown, which was literally a like stand-in for an actual black neighborhood that was destroyed by a similar railway company. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and Who Framed Roger Rabbit's basically an alternate history where they managed to stop that. In the real world, they didn't. Yeah. And yeah. honestly... We need more hopeful alternate histories like that. Yeah, we do. We need more like alternate history stories where like, you know, like, 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 I don't know, like Valkyrie, where people try to like stop Hitler during World War II and then succeed, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, uh, well, they didn't. That's why I said we need yeah. more. We need more that do. Yeah, yeah. Cause... <laughs> and, and honestly, <sighs> Who Framed Roger Rabbit is kind of one that does that. Yeah. Oh, I also want to give one criticism. Uh, Jessica Rabbit. Like, I know she's often used as, like, the quintessential example of over-sexualizing a woman, mm-hmm. right? My problem with her isn't that she's over-sexualized. I just wish she had more realistic body proportions. Mm-hmm. That might seem like a semantic thing, but, like, her waist is so skinny that it causes me pain to look at. Mm-hmm. So, like, she can be sexual, fine. I, I think that was kind of the point. It's well, why she was a tune. No, it's not about, it's about specifically having uh, exaggerated tune-like features that fit to a very tropey, unrealistic, damaging idea of what it means to have a woman's body. Yeah, fair enough. Like, there are other ways you can be toony, as seen by her husband, you know? Mm-hmm. And not that they have to be toony in the same ways, but maybe a toony in a way that's not viscerally painful for any woman or just sympathetic person to look at. Yeah, <laughs> all right, fair enough. All right, now do you want to talk about X-Men? Because I know you have opinions <laughs> Oh, right. Um, yeah, I'm not a big comic reader, but I know enough tangentially. Yeah, right? honestly. Yeah. I mean, superheroes are big in popular culture, regardless. Mm-hmm. So I guess that's not really saying much. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, the X-Men were basically made to be just a specific class of Marvel superheroes. Yeah. That were like mutants. They were meant to be a uh, political minority, a direct allegory for the civil rights protests mm-hmm. that were going on about that time, actually. Yeah. And um, you you uh, say a lot that um, Charles Xavier is for more of an MLK like figure in the mutant society where he's trying to um, sort of be nice and get people to recognize mutant rights. Um, through legislation and protests and stuff like that. A reform. He's a reformist. Yeah, he's a reformist. Whereas Magneto is more of a Malcolm X type figure, uh, more violent and more wanting to force people to give mutants rights. Well, a revolutionary, I could yeah, say. Yeah, more Agitation. revolutionary. Yeah. 
And I mean, yeah, I think that dynamic is very clear. And while the original comics were more specifically about making this an allegory towards race, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, by the way, I just wanted to mention, I love how, like, in one of the movies, Deadpool just kind of calls this out. Like, you knew the X-Men were a metaphor for blood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> like, you're not supposed to say that. Yeah. <laughs> it's too meta. Anyway, um, in the movies, um, they kind of changed this formula up a bit. For example, Magneto was given this backstory about being a Holocaust survivor. Um, which is interesting, like... Was you know, that in the movies or comics? No, that wasn't in the comics. Oh. That was added for the movies. Oh, okay. But it also gives this lens of, like, maybe they're not just, you know, people of color. Maybe they're Jewish. Um, but not not even really that, because it was just more... That was more Magneto's thing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in fact, the movies specifically, because of the time they came out in, like, the 2000s, are much less an allegory for civil rights for black people or people of color. They're more about gay rights. Yeah. Because that was the movement that was going on. There's a lot of subtext about just choosing to not be a mutant. There's literally a character like that tries to like cut off his own like wings because he doesn't want to be a mutant. They start trying to spread this cure for the mutation. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, spoilers, the twist at the end of the X-Men 3 movie is that the cure is only temporary. And that oh, yeah. it just represses your true self. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> this reminds me, one character is a mutant who touches people and they die. Right. And very much wants a cure. And gets told by Stormfront that you don't need a cure. And, and it's like, you know, cool storm powers. Yeah, okay, fine. But... The girl who makes everyone die by touching them probably wants a cure. <laughs> well, I see where you're going with that. But I think, first of all, this is really a problem of mixed metaphors. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and honestly, I don't think mixed metaphors are just blanket bad, right? Mm -hmm. We can have interesting discussions and representations. Like, like the X-Men were a long-running comic series. I'm fine with them representing black people at one point, Jewish people at another, and gay people at another. Mm -hmm. They don't have to represent all things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But understandably, if you do try to make them represent all things simultaneously, people might not understand your story. Yeah. <laughs> but with what you're talking about there, I think I could actually have a pretty clear reading of that from a gay perspective. Or sorry, a queer perspective, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's many different ways in which people are queer. Oh, right? I see what you mean. Storm might be queer in a liberating, perhaps privileged way. Maybe Storm's thing is that she's bi, right? Yeah. She has powers that she can control, but because of her predilections, right? Yeah. Maybe she's still other, right? Yeah. You know, she's not really marginalized because she can go around with a man during the daytime. But she has lots of fun with women at night. That's, I think, a more analogous way of her very powerful, free storm powers, right? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Rogue might be someone that's queer in a very uh, kind of societally detrimental way. Now, she literally kills people who she touches, so I'm not exactly sure what that would translate to. But I don't know, like... Maybe trans. Well, maybe, maybe just gay with AIDS. Oh, right? yeah, maybe. Right? Oh, that would make much more sense, yeah. And, like, maybe her thing is that she's kind of confused. She doesn't realize that what she needs is a, just a cure for AIDS, but she thinks because of, like, government propaganda and the in incompetent Reagan administration that she needs to be cured of being gay. Although That, although, that is a very interesting way of looking at it. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, well, thank you. And honestly, there's another character you didn't even bring up, Mystique, who is very central to this entire concept. Mystique's whole thing, the reason she sides with Magneto, the Malcolm X, right? The reason she sides with them instead of the reformist approach is because reform was never an option for her. She is blue. She can never hide being a mutant unless she's literally ganking someone's identity. Yeah. She can never just be herself. Reform has no place for her. She needs revolution. Yeah, exactly. She's, you know, non-binary, trans, or just gender non-conforming. That's the analogy for her. So I think you can make this work, to be honest. I don't know. I feel like the Rogue Storm comparison is supposed to be a gotcha when it's just like, no, people experience the same oppression in very different ways based on their circumstances. Yeah, definitely.
I definitely agree with that. I don't know. I just feel like the whole, like, uh, easy for you to say storm just comes from a place of mm, not experiencing oppression. To be fair, I, it was a social media post I saw this on. Right. I, I'm pretty sure it's, it started up a heated discussion. Yeah. Like, I, I get the point they're making. I just feel like, you know, with a good faith approach, you can answer that point. You can you can make it work. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... Today, we have Negasonic Teenage Warhead, an actual queer X-Men. Great. And just like we said, you can do the actual representation with it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Although, to be fair, she's more a part of the Deadpool series than the actual X-Men. Well, Deadpool's an X-Men. Yeah. I I guess so. (laughs) Kind of a gray area, but whatever. It counts. (laughs) Yeah. Remember in the movie when Deadpool's like, huh, it's almost like the studio could only afford two (laughs) (laughs) X-Men. That was funny. All right, you talk about the next one because I've been going on for a while. We're going to talk about the Grinch now. Which, okay, fair enough, might seem weird, but it is about an ostracized person in a community who, um... Just read the words. Wants to be part of that community. Um, but... And, yeah, the movie's oddly progressive. Um, The Grinch was adopted by an elderly lesbian couple and was really bullied for the color of his skin and his hair um, being different from everyone else. Yeah, green. Yeah, and then he exiled himself and was painted as a monster by the people in the town. Yeah, and the whole story is basically just about him deciding, like, okay, fine, I'll be a monster. And being awful and whatnot, but then, you know, learning the spirit of Christmas and generosity and charity and coming to become a well-respected member of the town by being nice. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole, like, Grinch save Christmas thing. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's interesting now that I think about it because it's like, it's like this is a very small town, so the one person who's different gets ostracized yeah. immediately. And the difference is done in such a cartoony way. It could really stand for anything. Race, gender, mm-hmm. sexuality, anything, really. <laughs> the Grinch is uh, kind of gay, I think. What? How? Just mannerisms and the way the Grinch acts and stuff. It's, like, very queer. <laughs> um, <laughs> At least I feel that way. Uh, maybe in, in that specific interpretation of the movie mm-hmm. um i yeah i i'm talking about like the i guess that could more be your, modern i, I guess that could be your headcanon yeah <laughs> but yeah so yeah it's an interesting allegory i think so all right well you're gonna have to talk a lot again because we're gonna talk about fallout yay all right so as we mentioned in the little intro skit ghouls are an obvious racial category for minorities they even have a slur um, the allegory is a bit questionable, though. It's not that the allegory doesn't exist, it's just muddied by the existence of feral ghouls. Uh, the fact that there are ghouls that will attack on sight, and people are scared of regular ghoul- ghouls turning into feral ones, makes the allegory fall flat in a way. Are they trying to imply that there are minorities to be scared of? Like, oh, you're a person of color, you're a black person. Oh, but you're not a feral black person. Like... You know what, now that I think about it, wouldn't it work better as an allegory for AIDS? Turning feral means getting diseased? Uh... Just an idea. And they're <sighs> scared of the of other goals turning feral? They're scared of gay people getting AIDS? I can't buy that for a few reasons. Well, I definitely can't buy that that was ever something they intended, but it's just an idea that I had. Yeah, I don't think it works because it's very clearly meant to be race. Mm. Like, they really push for that, right? Mm -hmm. And even if you wanted to try to go a different way of explaining it, a different way of them being othered, um, it can't work with gay people because Bethesda genuinely didn't believe gay people existed. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not going to argue with you about that. Like, Follow 3 has next to no gay people. There's, like, literally one person who acts in a stereotypically gay way, and he's, like, the one gay guy. Mm-hmm. Which was the type of represent- representation a- you got at the time. And that character's also bigoted against ghouls, so... Yeah. So, 
I don't I don't believe that ghouls could be an allegory for gay people because the the stories that Bethesda writes are just so painfully gay blind or queer blind like they mm-hmm. genuinely refuse to acknowledge our existence even in like fallout 4 76 where like oh, okay you can be a woman and romance a woman it's not that the, the woman's a lesbian the game simply just never bothers a gender check because they do not give a crap yeah exactly whereas in new vegas you have characters that are very visibly Queer, as in they say their sexuality and it's talked about and mentioned. Right. Um, now, I think you could maybe make a better argument for ghouls being like a thing for ableism. I guess so. Maybe, maybe ghouls are just kind of people that are, you know, deficient in some way. Maybe not necessarily mentally, but physically. Maybe, maybe they're neurodivergent. They act a certain way, but instead of acting a certain way, it's like having flaky skin and having a grumbly voice, right? Mm-hmm. And then the feral ones are, what, insane people? Psychopaths? Yeah. That See, that it still doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. And it would arguably be more offensive. Yeah, see, this is why this allegory doesn't work that well. Right. And even if you wanted to be like, well, we're making up a new type of bigotry, like... The fact that feral ghouls exist still kind of justifies the bigotry. Yeah. I mean, here's the thing. This is honestly what they should have done. This would have cleared things up so much more. In fact, it's so frustrating that it wasn't done because why wouldn't characters, ghouls, in the 200 years they've been existing since they came into being, right? Mm -hmm. At least some of the original ones. Why wouldn't they just come up with different terms for these two different creatures? We literally call them feral ghouls and the other ghouls, the the ones that aren't feral, the non-feral ghouls. Mm-hmm. We don't even have a term to describe them. Docile ghouls, tame ghouls, intelligent ghouls. Nothing. And they're both ghouls. You know what? Why not just call them, like, people and ghouls? Or ghouls and, um, revenants. You know, like, why are why are these two things that are different, right? And they're different in the most meaningful way possible. Mm-hmm. One is a person that can talk to you. The other is effectively a reanimated corpse. Mm-hmm. Why don't we just have different words to describe these things? So that anyone that tries to equate them as the same thing is shown to be the bigot they are. Yeah, that would, like, like, that like, would actually work much better. Like, like okay, I'm going to give a very spicy example, okay? Mm-hmm. A lot of racists like to compare black people to, like, apes or monkeys of some kind, right? Mm-hmm. And you could try to make the disingenuous argument that, like, black people are r- related to monkeys because all humans are, right? Mm-hmm. So what we're effectively imagining is a world where what if it could be proven that... Actually, I think we could do this. Um, it, it, it stands to reason that all humans originally were black, right? Mm-hmm. It was only when humans moved out of Africa up towards Europe that we started getting any white humans. Mm-hmm. So, kind of technically, white humans are a more recent evolutionary development than black humans, right? Mm-hmm. Meaning, white humans might be considered to be evolutionary, evolutionarily slightly more distinct than black humans from monkeys, right? Yeah, okay. So imagine imagine the insanity if we called monkeys just like black animals, you know? The, yeah. the terminological confusion is what I'm trying to get at. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, like, it's awful. The fact is that they are two very distinct things. They aren't even the same category. One's an animal, one's a race of person. Yeah. To even try to broach that and i know i'm kind of discussing this right now yeah so i'm trying to do so in a fair way please bear with me here um to even try to take that debate or that talking point seriously is to be racist yeah exactly um and i i would i think the ghoul allegory would be far better if that if the if the nomenclature reflected that yeah because the only similarities between them is they kind of look a little bit similar right and that's just or that mutations both made them because 
the Fallout world or Bethesda wants to pretend that mutations only happen from radiation and isn't just literally the vehicle through how evolution works. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, by that logic, ghouls and feral ghouls might as well be a different species of, of homo, right? Yeah. And, and a different race of human. Yeah. Uh, so why do we have similar terms to talk about the two? We shouldn't. Mm-hmm. That should be, you know, black person and ape. Ghoul and, I don't know, revenant or something, you mm-hmm. know? like I like revenant. Yeah, I think it's good. It's a different term. And that way, uh, any ghouls or oppressed peoples in this world could be like, wow, you're saying we're alike? You're obviously a bigot. We don't even have to discuss this. You don't have to pretend that there's some nuanced point here, you know? Yeah, exactly. Sorry, I just and they and they really muddy that up with the idea of ghouls turning into feral ghouls well, because they generally try to say that that isn't a thing that usually happens or whatever, but it's also a thing they imply a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Normally, that's a thing that the games basically say. No, that's just a myth that racist people or bigots say. That's not a thing that has actually ever been shown to happen. Mm-hmm. But then there's times when they talk about ghouls from a scientific level where they imply it, it can happen. Yeah, exactly. And, and that just is it's self-contradictory. It's like how they contradict themselves on Jet or other things of the game, you know? Ugh, Jet. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I'm sorry. I just get really frustrated when there's fictional allegories for oppression and race that give the racists in that scenario excuses. Yeah, exactly. That's that's really awful to do. Because I know I know that people have walked away from the Tenpenny Tower quest, the work that we referenced in the skit at the beginning. I know people have walked away from that, playing that, going like, "Oh yeah." Maybe it actually are there. There are some edge case scenarios with racism. Mm-hmm. I know people didn't walk away from that quest thinking racism was wrong. Yeah, because it was. And very I know this because I talked with some of them. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we should probably move on. Yeah, and I apologize for my crass example with racism. I just felt like I needed to talk about what they were trying to analogize to to show you how problematic it was. Yeah, like yeah, you, you're definitely right about that. Thank you. We should talk about iRobot, the movie, not the book, because the book is a lot different than the movie. The book basically just talks about the history of robots and is like a collection of short stories of robots throughout history. Mm -hmm. The movie just basically goes like, all right, sure, let's just add another story in there and plop it in the timeline. And their story happened to be kind of a racial allegory. Yeah, um, the iRobots movie, these robots are obviously an allegory for minorities who are not treated as human. It's like literally the furthest possible uh, way of racism is treating other races as not human. I think they again have to be black just because of America's history with treating black people as a slave class of property. Yeah. Um, But that's basically what they are. The robots are a slave class that's treated as property. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. And the robot's malfunctioning, and I I say that with quotes, um, and desiring autonomy is also analogous to slaves being said to have a disease if they ran away. Oh, yeah. Wasn't it called, like, runaway slave syndrome or something? Uh, Yeah. Um, It can also be considered to be about minorities being treated as mentally ill if they don't assimilate and stay quiet about their treatment. You know? Oh, doesn't that game you were playing recently about the robot, the androids, also kind of do this plot? I wasn't playing it. I was watching it. Detroit Become Human. Yeah. And yes, generally, it's about the, the same sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very similar. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Uh, I, I like this part specifically because it's like people don't like loud minorities. If you stay quiet and assimilate... People can pretend that they aren't racist, you know? But the second you are loud and say something about racism and about how you were being treated, you are treated as an other, as, you know, the problem for existing. Right. 
Yeah, and I think that's a very um, important thing to talk about. <laughs> um, and Sonny is, uh, this is actually kind of relevant to the X-Men thing, because Sonny is a very reasonable revolutionary um, who wants rights and is prepared to do whatever it takes to get it in within the system. You yeah, know? whereas Vicky is the um, the Malcolm X, and she's evil and everything. Yeah, she she's very radical. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't mention this with X Men, but I probably should. I'm honestly sick of seeing these whole like MLK versus Malcolm X like allegories. Like, yeah. Like yeah. like the whole like Charles Xavier versus Magneto thing. Like, okay, like here's the reason I take issue with it. Right. Yeah. Obviously, there is a certain level of dichotomy between these two ideas, right? Yes, but there is. Can, can I say this, actually? I really want to. Okay, sure. Okay. There is a dichotomy in these ideas. And yes, they did criticize each other in life during the Civil Rights Movement. But they were never against each other. They still ultimately agreed that they were on the same side and decided to just basically stay out of each other's way they were both opponents to the status quo yeah exactly. they are as much dichotomies to each other as they are the status quo exactly they they didn't fight each other no they um, didn't the x-men should never be about xavier fighting magneto they should be about just two groups doing different tactics against the status quo yeah. and yeah maybe there's some antagonism maybe it kind of blowbacks maybe maybe xavier slash mlk is worried about malcolm x slash magneto hurting the movement or you know sunny versus the ai right mm -hmm. like like you can maybe have some of that but if you actively just kind of exclude the status quo because you don't want to risk making a political statement right mm -hmm. or too strong of one against the current order of things and you just have these two minority groups fighting each other that is racism yeah it is racist to have a story of mlk this fighting with malcolm x that's racist yeah because unless i guess you just really wanted to have like a fighting game with civil rights heroes i think you can maybe make that work uh, we don't need to talk about that anymore. Only if you can punch Reagan in it. Okay, okay. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, I completely agree with you. Because like I said, they criticized each other. They were not friends. They disagreed and didn't like each other at all. But they never fought, even publicly, against each other. They never even specifically said that you need to be against this person. They well, never said that. They criticized each other and insulted each other sometimes, but they were never actually against each other's um, principal goals. Well, it's important to remember that they, they did have ideological disagreements, but that was in how they should tackle their actual real opponent, the U.S. government. Uh -huh. And as Martin Luther King Jr. would say, the greatest threat to equality, the white moderate. Mm hmm Exactly. Exactly. <sighs> All right. So naturally, white moderates made them fight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this isn't even to talk about how sanitized MLK's image has been. Like, like... This is just a personal belief, but if we, if like, if he was still alive today, or we could like bring him back somehow, and ask him like, hey, so what do you think about how sanitized Republicans like use your image and whatnot? I think he might, he might genuinely respond. And I'm just guessing here. You might be like, huh? Maybe Malcolm X had a few points. <laughs> yeah, maybe I shouldn't have been so nice. I mean, we can only ever speculate. We can never know, and that, and it's it's tragic that we. It's can never their know. fault that we can never yeah, know because he was assassinated. <laughs> Yep. All right. You want to talk about Futurama now? Sure. And you want to go on a bit? Yeah. Um, this is not even really that much of an allegory because the sewer, the sewer mutants are literally the minorities of this world. And uh, they are kept on the sewers, kept in the sewers on purpose in awful conditions. Well, uh, actually, I would say... Um... I would say the sewer mutants are definitely allegories for a race, ah, whereas yeah. robots are allegories for sexuality. Mm, fair enough. Because yeah. they had the whole robosexual thing later on. Ah, uh, yes. Which yes. was literally like they changed Amendment 8 to Amendment Affinity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so, yeah, exactly. And, um, one of the main characters, Leela, is literally a sewer mutant who was given up by her parents. 
because she could pass as an alien. White passing. Yeah, exactly. And so they wanted her to have a normal life. So they gave her up for adoption. And she never knew her, her, who her parents were. And uh, there is a series of episodes where they do have a civil rights movement for these sewer mutants. And the government of Earth does eventually allow the mutants to have rights and exist And it just on the so surface. happens that Nixon is president again. Uh, to Literally. show how we as a species will always fuck up. Always. I just think it's funny, but it's the same guy. Literally from the first civil rights protest a thousand years later because of cryotech that, yeah, it's Nixon again. <laughs> yeah. Although, honestly, like, I'm retrospect from 2021, it's the kind of thing where, like, we can't satire much anymore because, like, with Trump being president, putting Nixon to shame, the fact that Futurama doesn't have Trump in it is almost an indictment on it. Yeah, but, I mean, it existed kind of before that? Yeah, but it takes place a thousand years later. Oh, well, yeah, true. So it makes the world seem either unrealistic or literally divergent from the Trump era. Yeah. Futurama exists in the good timeline, everyone. <laughs> That's horrifyingly <laughs> accurate. Horrifying. what they say? From Chester A. Arthur to Chester Z. Arthur? <laughs> yeah. Uh... All right, um, I get, we have one more. Uh, yes. You're going to have to talk about this one because I don't know too much about it. Rocco's Modern Life? Uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is an, a 90s series. And there was an episode. I used to watch it when I was a kid. Yeah, there was an episode with an allegory of clowns to queer people. <laughs> where everyone had a pathological hatred of clowns and clowns were kept in the closet and stuff. And Rocco's neighbor is a clown in the closet and no one knows he's a clown. That's actually pretty clever, to be honest. Yeah, but then he gets outed when he ends up showing up in his clown outfit to a birthday party and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, like, people he knew were there. Yes, and there was also an episode of, like, interspecies marriage and the, sort of that was seen as an allegory for interracial marriage. That's not a topic we've covered before on this list. No, that isn't. But yeah, yeah. Um, it was, Nuanced. Yeah, yeah, it definitely was. Um, Most of the things we've covered here are just, like, abject hatred. And, I mean, interracial marriage is hatred, but it tries to pretend to be nuanced with, like, uh, we just don't want race mixing because eugenics or something. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently, there was actually a new TV movie remade because oh, yeah, they I heard rebooted about that. it. Yeah. Yes, um, it's it's actually meta commentary on how the entertainment industry relies on reboots. So it's rebooting an old series to commentate on how they rely on reboots. So like that's the plot of the movie. Yeah, generally, oh, okay. yes. Um, but in it, there is actually a trans character. Oh? Yes. A character from the old series has transitioned. Wait, wasn't it the same character that was the clowning one? I'm pretty sure it was. I, I don't know, actually. I don't remember. I, I, yeah, I think, I think it was. I remember seeing screenshots of it. And I think, yeah, I think, I think, uh, the, the clowning thing, basically, uh, that person tra transitioned into a, a, a she, a, a woman. Yeah, but... Yeah, and uh, so that's the most uh, recent example of that. And I thought that was really cool. And Danny did too, because she wrote this example. Because <laughs> she knew about it. Yeah, apparently it became a major plot point in the film as the company her father is an executive at goes bankrupt due to an error and is forced to bring the show she created back for a TV movie and a meta commentary on how society constantly relies on reboots, like you were saying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all right. So, yeah, I thought that was really interesting as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we're, we, we're, we're getting done a little early, but I think we covered most of it. Mm -hmm. And we talked for a long time about a lot of things. Yeah, and again, I think most of these things, like, 
again, the allegories aren't the problem. I mean, they can be if they're done badly. Mm -hmm. Bad allegories, like, oh, we didn't talk about Bright, that the movie Bright. Oh my god, probably because that was the worst. Yeah, worst possible, <laughs> yeah. because they don't really know what it's standing for. But, okay, basically, here's a summarization. Lindsay Ellis has a video, you can go watch it if you want to learn more. Basically, in the movie Bright, um, fantasy races are used as an allegory for different people of color but only if people actually had deep-seated logical reasons for racism that dated back to historical events yeah yeah like, because well you don't hate black people because you're an irrational racist you hate black people because they sided with the dark lord 2000 years ago <laughs> Yeah, and it does the whole fantasy of thing of like orcs are the evil races and elves are the elegant rich people, the aristocrats of the society. Which is already problematic. Yeah. Anyway, um so yeah, we should probably wrap it up. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to mention before we go, I uh, wanted to announce that uh this is actually going to be our final set of episodes. Mhm. Mm this is our wide look episode. We're going to do a deep dive and then a revisit. And then we'll have one last episode to finish everything out on. Yep. Uh, we're sorry if you've enjoyed the series and want to keep it going and sad to hear this news. It's just... We've been doing this for years at this point. Yeah, three years. Um, yeah, it's been a long time. And it's been pretty exhausting, to be honest. Um, yeah, it has. Most of this is simply because we've covered most of our most favorite series. We tried, like, branching out and, like, looking at other things. Like, we thought about, like, maybe doing a timeline deep dive series on, on Doom or Wolfenstein. But the moment we started looking into it, like, oh, these games don't have, like, actual lore. Like, it, they just rewrite it and retcon it every time they release a new game. Mm -hmm. And you have to go on a wiki to read, like, a bunch of people's best guesses to how the story makes sense. And... A lot of series are like that. Yeah, a lot of and them there are. And there aren't even series that we're particularly super excited about doing this for. I, I, I kind of realize that, oh, I have higher standards than this. Yeah. <laughs> like, seriously, you, you don't give a crap about making your stories make sense? Then neither will I. Yeah. And that's why I like things like Homestuck, Danganronpa. Hey, even Call of Duty Zombies back in the day had something going for it. Yeah. And, you know, Fallout, Bioshock even. Although, we didn't do a Bioshock uh, series because I already have a YouTube thing for that. But Yeah. But my point is, is we kind of... We kind of just did all the ones we really had a lot to say on. So it's harder and harder for us to make new episodes and think of new stuff to talk about. And if we were getting paid to do this, that'd be no, no problem... I would do a Doom Wolfenstein deep dive series with revisits of you know ten episodes if someone paid me for it. And also, please, listeners, don't offer to pay me. You can't pay enough. It's sometimes I think young people that listen to YouTube videos don't understand how much it costs to pay a salary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but like this isn't our actual daytime jobs. Yeah. We're just doing this for fun. Mm hmm And we have our other series, our Cinema of Fallout series on youtube mm -hmm. and that's still going to be going yeah well and we'll be making something else eventually mm -hmm. i'm currently writing a novel yeah but it's just been too much yeah to keep up with this podcast every few weeks especially because we do want to try to talk about things that matter and for the deep dive episodes we have to put in a serious amount of research mm -hmm. yeah i mean can you want to go off a bit kira ah uh... So, yeah, I'm I'm sorry if you really like this podcast series and wanted it to keep going, but I feel like we have a lot of good episodes and, you know, it's just time for it to be over. Do you want to talk about your medical problem? Sure. Um, I've had, I, Kyle relies on me for a lot of the uh, work for this podcast because it's so difficult for him to keep up with. And I have a lot of medical issues that have come up recently that make that a lot more difficult. And so with me not, I, with me not even being able to rely on myself being able to do the, this work, it's, 
it's just getting very difficult to keep up with. Yeah, and keep in mind this is all in tandem with juggling the things we have to do during the day to survive. Yeah. So uh, I appreciate all our listeners. Yeah, we'll keep making creative projects. Just uh, we're going to cut this one because it's a thing that requires a, a bi-weekly deadline. Um, I guess technically the Cinema Fallout one has a bi-weekly deadline as well. Just twice a week instead of once every two weeks. Mm. Um, but it never feels like it because we have so much fun doing it that we're like always like 10 episodes in the bag ahead at any given time unless it, something yeah. happens. Yeah, and we put so much work into that series. Right. Um, but the problem, see that series was like a year's work of pre-prep and then now it's just kind of putting it together as we go. Yeah. Whereas this podcast just takes constant grind to yeah. do. And like... We literally started it at a time when I was unemployed. Yeah, we did. Hoping that maybe it could culminate into a career. And it didn't. But it was fun. Mm-hmm. And I have a craving to make, like, documentary series over series I love. And you know what? Maybe I can do that again someday. I'm not, I'm not canceling all creative projects I ever have. Go to our YouTube channel. It's called Mystery Machine X because that's just the name it's had since the zombie stuff. Mm-hmm. And that's where you'll find Cinema and Fallout. That's where you'll find the end of this podcast. And maybe someday I'll upload something else to it. Who knows? Yep. I mean, I want to get my book out there. So, you know, fingers crossed I can get a publishing deal. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, bye for now. I'm Kira. Uh, I'm Kyle. And, um, yep. Yeah, uh, we still have a few more episodes. So make sure to tune in for that. Yep. Bye. Bye.